Well, uh, our ends are our beginnings, as T.S. Eliot said. So I want to, in a way, loop back, and especially if some of you maybe have been here for, uh, you know, the six months that we've been doing this, starting it in, the, in April of the pandemic. Uh, but some of you haven't, and uh, some of you might be just tuning in, you know, uh, uh, recently. So uh, uh, I'd like to circle back just generally every once in a while to, to just touch base with how we started. We started uh, this, uh, um, this uh, three-month segment with uh, uh, a poem called uh, Everybody's uh, Journey. And we were trying to look at uh, uh, no matter who you are as a human being, you're on, we're all on this same journey. And uh, it's, uh, it's a journey from uh, uh, what I called uh, nobody when we're just born uh, to uh, somebody uh, and then uh, ultimately to everybody. And I want to just sort of tease that out a little bit uh, and use uh, uh, to, to bring us back to that. And then really hopefully we can get a look at what it's like, what it's like for a human being to become everybody, get an actual example of that. And then uh, just sort of have the, uh, the um, encouragement to do it yourself. So I'm gonna go back to the screen share for a minute uh, and uh, put up something that some of you have seen, but maybe not everybody. Uh, okay, there we are, I think. Should be looking at uh, a model, uh, <laughs> my Sharpie model of uh, oceanic consciousness, which uh, some of you have, and if for some reason you didn't have it in you'd want it, well, just let me know that. You can drop me an email and I'll just send it all uh, off to you. But this, this, these three levels of consciousness roughly uh, co correspond to that, uh, that progress, that journey from nobody uh, to everybody, or to somebody to everybody. Uh, nobody doesn't mean you don't exist. It just means when uh, uh, that's the top uh, section of consciousness, it just means uh, when we, uh, when we're born, um, it's, uh, you know, it's what I call we're born as an instinctive self. And um, uh, we're learning how to do a kind of survival dance. We're sort of working off the brain stem. Uh, might not have developed all the real higher consciousness uh, and deeper consciousness that we need. But we're trying to survive, you know. And uh, uh, that goes on for a while. Uh, until we can develop actually uh, a more of our cognitive abilities, and that's the mid-range of, uh, of consciousness called the thinking mind. Um, and uh, what comes out there is the uh, ability to do the strategic dance. We can start to be strategic about it. And uh, we're playing strategy. We're playing chess with the world. We're not just, we can survive now, but we're really trying to... Uh, accomplish things and uh that's also where we get the narrative self we start to uh um, um put together our own sense of self in most cases uh, uh contributed by images other people give us parents teachers siblings etc and some of those images might not be great might take a lifetime to actually realize well uh that's not who i am but so we all do this. We all have a biography at this point. And, uh, and it's ongoing. It's a kind of narrative self. Uh, that's the somebody of us. You know, like, who are you? You know, sometimes when I would do retreats, people would say, could you s send a short biographical sketch? <laughs> One time when I was going to, uh, to do a uh, 11th step uh, with a bunch of uh, uh, guys in the, uh, around Cincinnati who were all addicted to various things. And I was going to go to talk about meditation, which is basically the 11th step. They wanted my biography. And so I said, uh, uh, I remember covering Eagle Holic. <laughs> and that's what I said. And then they said, well, we need a little more than that. But that really is your biography up to that point. 
Uh, and then when you, you can, to become everybody is when you, you drop down into that um, deepest sense of uh, below the thinking mind. Doesn't mean the thinking mind goes away. Uh, or they, you know, we need it. We even need the instinctive self, you know, jump out of the way from a speeding vehicle, and et cetera, et cetera. So we don't want to get rid of anything. We just want to be able to go deeper and access something deeper. And that's the, the deepest level of consciousness I call heart awareness. And um, now we, we develop a kind of witnessing self. And uh, this is where we can do the sacred dance. So survival dance, strategic dance, all good. But then, you know, especially if you're in the second half of life and uh, you've played the strategic dance, you've done a lot of things and you, you know, who knows what you've done. You've, you've, you've done good or, or good or ill for the, uh, for the world, hopefully good. And, um, you know, now you're retired, you know, you're not doing your nine to five job to, uh, to pay the rent. Hopefully you have, uh, uh, well, many people have made enough uh, money uh, to, where they don't have to work anymore. Well, then what? Well, there's always that third leg of the journey. You've been somebody, and now you're a comfortable somebody with a roof over your head and enough to eat and, you know, cable TV or whatever. Uh, but then what? Well, then there's that last leg of the journey, which doesn't ever end, by the way. <laughs> it's this sacred dance. And uh, we've worked on this uh, this whole idea of uh, the second half of life, especially, we're meant to go to our from our survival and strategic dance to the sacred dance, learning how to dance with God, uh, learning how to dance with all of life, and that's a different kind of dance. And you see, all you know, there's things there that are important in that sacred dance: presence, uh, sense of silence, and so uh, we've worked on uh, a couple of different. Uh, uh, practices over this six months period. We started out for three months doing Tonglen, which is a kind of uh, Tibetan practice, a great Tibetan practice that helps you deal with suffering in, in a compassionate way. And uh, we haven't left that, although we left the, the stress on it during our sessions. I mean, I'm doing it all the time on the fly. Hopefully you are too. And then this last three months, we, um, we worked at learning how to uh, uh, drop down uh, into the deepest level of consciousness and then um, do this sacred dance with whatever, however you want to language it, with God, with the divine, with the beloved, the Sufis would call it, uh, with the Tao. You know, other traditions, many traditions have different names. But what is it like to, uh, to do that, to dance with God? And uh, we've been working on that. Uh, and so that's always the middle part of our session. We, we start off with a teaching and then, uh, uh, and then we actually drop into meditation or contemplation. Okay. And then uh, when we come out, uh, we have conversation. You know, when's the last time you had a great conversation as John O'Donoghue always asks. You know, we've had some great conversations here. So it's a sequence, inspiration, meditation, conversation. It's this three-part thing. It's really hard to get away from. Uh, so nobody, somebody, uh, everybody. People who don't make the somebody state usually don't show up, at least at this retreat house or for these. They're doing other, they're really trying to, they just, they got other work to do. But then what does it mean to be everybody? Well, I'm going to read you a, uh, um, a description of what it means to be everybody by, uh, in this book, uh, Conjectures of a, uh, a Guilty Bystander. Merton was one of these guys who made this tipping point where um, he, he tipped into having a stable, sort of a stable, stable state of, uh, of being an everybody. Uh, the Dalai Lama one time said, he said, uh, Besides, well, you've heard this, many of you have heard this before, that when I asked if he was enlightened, he said, oh, 70, 80 percent. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I got a big kick out of that because I was still a classroom teacher. And 70, 80 percent would be from D minus to C minus in most classes. But when you see a human being who is 70, 80 percent living in that deepest level of consciousness, 
he blows you away just to hear she what just her mere presence you know mother Teresa had that uh, now the percentage um, you know only the mind's worried about that. Basically, the Dalai Lama said, somehow when you get to 51%, everything changes. And then you live in the deepest level of consciousness and you make trips to the upper two as needed or you wander off and forget where you are, where home is and you come back. That's a lot of meditation as we'll, uh, we'll talk about. But uh, this is a think the, you know, we have a rare thing with Merton because Merton was a, like a compulsive writer. So when he had this experience where he sort of tipped over to 51%, it happened to be on a street corner in Louisville. There's a, there's a plaque down there, uh, a historical marker to somebody going over the tipping point. Really interesting. And uh, maybe the only one in this country. If you know of others, let me know. <laughs> but here's what Merton wrote about it. And you got to see the irony of this and the surprise of the Holy Spirit in all this is because Merton left New York City for the for this monastery in the country because he didn't think you could meet God in a city. He thought you had to go. I mean, this he was he needed that at the time, but he thought he you had to go and go behind monastery walls in the country and live the kind of monastic life to have any chance of uh, becoming uh, everybody. And uh, that wore out pretty quick <laughs> for Merton. And uh, so by the time, a, a couple weeks before this happened, he was writing in his own personal journal that he probably, he thought he maybe bet on the wrong horse because he wasn't feeling very liberated. He wasn't feeling like everybody. He was feeling sort of like hemmed in, you know. Oh, the honeymoon period had left long ago with the monastery, and he was just feeling sort of constricted. It wasn't what he was, he didn't feel liberated at all. Little did he know that a couple weeks later, it was the, he was going to hit that tipping point. And um, uh, it's really, he's a good guy to look at because it doesn't happen the way you think it's going to happen. And it doesn't happen when you want it to happen. For, Mer for Merton, he banged away in the monastery for 17 years before he hit this point. And there's no way to tell as you're doing your, you're on this journey, there's no way to tell a lot of times, um, if you're making any progress at all, he was wrong. He thought he had wasted 17 years and then boom, two, two weeks later, this moment. He says in Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, uh, it's now 4th and Muhammad Ali, at the corner of 4th and Walnut in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, a spurious self-isolation in a special world, the world of the monk. The whole illusion of a separate holy existence is a dream. Yeah, Merton was, do, doing whatever Trappist did in those days and still do when you have a, you, you make an appointment for the doctor in Louisville and you go out early in the morning and, uh, and then you spend the whole day goofing around in Louisville and you get back as late as possible. And that, that's exactly what he had planned. And he had been to the doctor, he was in his jeans, his jean jacket, he was ready to walk off the corner and then boom, uh, he saw everybody. And he says later, he said, um, the this, this sense of liberation that I felt from an illusionary difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. And then he said, uh, if only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There's no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. Yeah, so this is a classic thing. It won't happen to er anybody else like that. But this is what it looked like, at least one description of what happens when you hit that tipping point due to, you know, maybe, maybe many hard years of practice. Uh, and all of a sudden, you get a real sense of what it really means to be everybody. And it's just like the Buddha. The language is almost like the Buddha. He says, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people. He's in the middle of the shopping district here. And the last place he expected to meet God. I loved all those people that they were mine and I theirs. 
that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness. The whole illusion of a separate holy existence is a dream. Now that happened on uh, St. Joseph's Day, March 19th, uh, 1958. And he lived about another 10 years, but he lived differently. He never lost sight of that moment. And he started writing about all kinds of different issues. He wasn't writing about monastic stuff very much anymore. He was writing about social issues because he had become everybody in a way. He knew it, all those kids. So he was writing about racism, peace, justice, uh, the bomb, violence, war. And uh, he lost a lot of readers. As a matter of fact, after that point, this, this particular book, for instance, what he was writing at that time, none, nothing was published by Martin after that point. He, he, he never saw another thing actually in print. He had to give up that because they didn't like what he was writing about. But that was his, he had totally like made that turn, you see. So, uh, and he didn't look back. He just knew that, um, you, know, you know, everybody wanted him to write the Seven Story Mountain over and over again, or write about monastic things. Well, he had done that and, and it got him to the point where now he, could, he was actually connected with everybody, couldn't be isolated. The Buddha said, the, the Buddha so-called, the guy who woke up, that's a nickname. Buddha means somebody who's awake. He woke up to this the fundamental illusion that we're separate. You know, it's interesting to, to, to see all of us connected on this screen. You know, even though we're coming from all different directions, there's a kind of miracle to Zoom and the new uh, age because it gives us a, a look. Even though there's little, little things separating you, you know, you're not all blobbed together because we aren't. We're, we're all different but there's something that's connecting us. He said, uh, I wish you just can't go up to everybody and tell, tell each one of them that they're, they're shining like the sun, that we have this kind of inner radiance. So that changed Merton. Uh, I wrote, uh, you know, uh, again, poets don't, they don't plagiarize, they steal. And I, wrote this, <laughs> I, I wrote this poem to try to get in, at least in my experience, uh, and especially talking with the people I've been working with, some of them for oh, years, tell them, keep banging away at it. And they say, eh, you know, but, uh, you know, and sometimes they give up and then sometimes they go on holiday for a while and then come back. But I wrote it sort of my own experience, but I also wrote it for the people who are trying to walk this path of, of, of meditation and contemplation. And it just, I just call it the tipping point because that's sort of the way it happens. And so it goes like this. If you can practice with cheerful perseverance and stay committed to simply dropping your mind into the heart, then one fine morning with no hint of warning, the beloved will simply appear at your back door, eyes shining, just like the sun. That's just sort of the way it, it is. Uh, if, if you can, uh, <clears throat> if you can uh, practice, continue to practice with cheerful perseverance. That's a key on this thing. You got to, you know, to bang away at this every day, which ultimately people uh, uh, aspire to, to actually spend some time every day. What we're working on now is in a few minutes, we'll spend some time just dropping down as best we can onto the jewel dance floor with the Holy One, however you would language that or whatever you think that is. And we're just going to, we're going to spend some time with the divine. If you could, if you could uh, continue that practice day in, day out. I mean, why would you, would you really skip a day? <laughs> would really twice a day be too much if, you know, the divine was right here? Wouldn't that sort of get your attention? Well, it really is, but it's just, you know, it's not so tangible. But I'm, I'm telling you, you know, we have, we have the lives of the saints that say, yeah, if you can keep practicing with cheerful perseverance, it takes a lot of perseverance to show up every day, uh, and stay committed to, uh, this is my favorite image of dropping the mind into the heart. 
dropping down onto this, this deepest dance floor. Then one fine morning, with no hint of warning, the beloved will simply appear at your back door. I mean, everybody expects God to walk in through the front door the way we expect people to come into our house. It's going to be a surprise. And you have to always be ready for these surprises. The worst situation, I mean, the COVID pandemic brought us here. I really like my Sundays now. <laughs> uh, you know, Sunday has always been a little problematical for me but over the course of my life. You know, go back to work on Monday or, you know, get dragged by the, you know, get dragged into church in those early days. And, uh, you know, back to work on Monday. So Sundays can be a sort of depressing day for some people. But uh, they're wonderful now. Uh, I really enjoy this. So that was a gift of something. I came in the back door of the COVID thing for me. And so uh, without any sense of uh, uh, warning, the beloved appears 